with my kids and my wife, but we didn't even have food. And we would go to the local church to eat. But look what the Lord has done. I kept being persistent and saying, God has a plan for me. Like for everybody, God has a purpose and a plan. Mm -hmm. And it's not to harm us, but to give us hope in the future. But when I got saved and I was released, I knew, you know, I was serving God, you know, and you serve God, you're in his um, his protection and his, and, and his light. So I, I didn't fear that somebody would kill me or somebody would do something bad to me. And this is where I tell people, you want to let go of drugs, you want to let go of addictions, you want to let go of depression, subscribe to this, the Holy Scripture, Philippians. The Word of God will set, will, will set the captives free, mentally and spiritually. I want Amen. also to remind you something you missed when you were in yeah. prison. You were uh, ordering the Bible from outside to prison. Yeah, yeah. So while we were in prison, my brother and I, we started to send letters to the local churches around the uh, detention center. And so we said, we need Bibles. We need materials. We need literature. Mm -hmm. And so there was one individual by the name of uh, the late Leroy Rixey. He was on a Salem Communication radio station, and he had a show called The Children's Hour and also um, an evening show. And we wrote to him. And he was so impressed by my brother and I that he mentioned us on the radio. And he had a national audience. And so we asked for Bibles, and he became my mentor, even post-prison. Uh, when I was released, he uh, was my mentor. And so we started to uh, contact all these uh, local churches and the uh, American uh, Bible Society in New York. And they sent us a number of Bibles and we were uh, training our deacons, our, the inmates in prison to distribute the Bible. So when an inmate would enter into the unit, he would say, welcome to the Miracle Deliverance Center, not Metropolitan Detention Center, Miracle Deliverance Center where the pastors the Mendoza brothers are in the back. Uh, here's a Bible. Here's some slippers. And we're here to love on you in the word of God. And so that was the kind of environment they're going into. Now we're going into an environment of that they wanted to hang themselves because there were situations like that. But they, they were finding solace and, and, and love through the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, and God using us there. What a different perspective to, you know, it, it, it reminds me that um, how our words have an effect on people and, yes. you know, they come into this prison system and they have this aha moment and instantly they, they see hope mm -hmm. instead of death exactly. and depression and anxiety. Yes. Such, right. Amen. Yeah, Amen. Thanks. I, Amen. I'm, I, I really look forward to your movie. Uh, cause yeah. wow, I, it, it certainly sounds like, uh, you can make a movie out of, uh, out of your testimony for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, your life story, mm -hmm. uh, what happened, uh, with working with the Korean children from four to 14? Yeah. So, so basically now we, we run this ministry. We have hundreds of kids that attend every Saturday. It's a three hour, uh, uh program. And now they're transitioning over to our church services on sunday mm. so parents are being transformed children and youth are being transformed a lot of these children are, are adults they're in either college or they they already obtained their uh their degrees and they come back and they support the ministry it's amazing and so my all my brothers now are serving the lord the two that were involved in narcotics they're serving the lord uh they're business people um my mom and, and, and dad, they went home to be with the Lord. Uh, they received, you know, Christ. Um, and, and so, you know, this is just an incredible story of God's redemption and God's love. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it reminds me, Jesus uh, speaking, who um, those who are forgiven lots uh, yeah. appreciate it more than those who are forgiven a little bit. Uh, is that yeah, and I can't help but think your testimony when when you gave your life to the Lord, what a 
what a light bulb moment, what a transformation instantly, and how you went out to reconcile some of the things, especially with your your mother right away, and then others, um, and put, you know, you only had this tiny bit of knowledge, but you put that knowledge that you had into work, and I really think that yeah. that's wisdom. Uh, and you know, just on that note, what you were saying is really interesting because. Uh, you know, sin has a ripple effect, obviously, and, and it destroys our, the very fabric of our society. But grace and Jesus has a more powerful result, which it restores the brokenhearted. It heals those that are wounded. It binds, you know, those that are just in, in, in total disarray. And it just reminds me of uh, how powerful God is. Just the other day, I was at a church in New Jersey, and it, it's a very, uh, it's a large congregation, have four campuses, it's called uh, Bethany uh, Church, and uh, I went there to speak to the men, it was close to 300 men there, and prior to my speaking engagement, someone approached me and says, I know you, but I looked at him, I said, I, I, I think I know you as well, <laughs> and so I didn't give it any thought, he goes, no, I'm going to tell you where you know me from, I said, okay, so right after we get done. I, I did a book signing. He comes up to me pretty much in tears. And he's a, he's a believer, Christian. Mm -hmm. He said, you, I used to transport, you used to give me drugs. And I used to transport it for you. I used to work under you. And I used to transport 10 kilograms of cocaine here and there. And, uh, and God saved me. And now seeing you as a minister of the gospel of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and what God has done in your life, that fortifies my faith that God is just so powerful, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to share that with, with your audience and with you folks. Uh, Pastor, Pastor, when you were preaching in, the inmate in prison, did you have any resistance or people who thought you were crazy, things like that? Yeah. Even, uh, we have resistance even, I'll, I'll share this, we even have resistance from other religious groups. They wanted to take our space so they can have their television, uh, you know, all their playing cards, spades, and things like that there. They wanted to take over our space, and they would take our chairs. And we would pray and fast, you know, for, for God to intervene, because we didn't want to get into conflict with them. We didn't want it to get into a physical altercation. And unfortunately, one of our church members did. And we felt bad about it, you know. Um, and it was someone that just came to, to the Lord uh, during my, my, my stint in prison. But, you know, even when I came out, I, I, start, I went back to the prison. I, I've been to the penitentiary on, in Indiana. I've been to Rikers Island ministering there. And you always get that resistance. But you know what? The gospel is more power than darkness. It mm -hmm. will tear down any stronghold. And so, you know, we don't fear... Uh, people trying to put resistance. We just show love and we preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. The enemy must flee. Right. Kind of reminds me of light and darkness and how darkness flees when light is shown. Amen. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, your lifestyle before Christ, uh, using those uh, powerful drugs, ever affect your health? You know, the alcohol did uh, at some point... Um, it took me a very long time um, to adjust with, with every time, it, this is years ago, years ago, I mean, it took me a very long time. Uh, my, my, my mouth would get dry. I mean, just constantly dry, dry. And it was because of alcohol. And I, I, would, I would have trem trembles uh, in my body uh, mm -hmm. because of the after effects of the alcohol. Uh, now, when I was, and I, I talk about this in my book, I, when I was using heroin, I never uh, used the needle. It was more, you know, uh, snoring it. But I remember one day I went to this, this house and I witnessed someone inject heroin into their body. And I saw their reaction and I never wanted to go that far in drugs to do that. But I, but I was addicted to heroin. I was addicted to cocaine. And... Uh, thank God that my experience with, with drugs only lasted about two years. There are people that, it, you know, 
they got 10 years, 15 years, and they and, and eventually they, they uh, pass on. Mm -hmm. uh, so it didn't last long. So it, it didn't affect me uh, in terms of my health, mm -hmm. uh, but it did affect me uh, at, to a certain point um, when I got saved, because I was always like a little bit paranoid, um, thinking that, you know, it was more because of my involvement, my distribution of cocaine, thinking somebody was, you know, following me and things of like that. Uh, you know, I, I don't owe no money to nobody. So I didn't have that kind of fear, but I always have fear that someone would, would kill me uh, because of the lifestyle I was living, because there were people in the organization that, that unfortunately, uh, you know, passed and things have happened. So that kind of thing that I was dealing with, uh, but when I got saved and I, I was released, I knew, you know, I was serving God, you know, and you serve God, you, you're in his, um, his protection and his, and, and his light. So I, I didn't fear that somebody would kill me or somebody would do something bad to me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have, you know, thank God I didn't have any uh, uh, effects due to the drugs I was consuming. So your wife came to see you in prison. And yes. she was going to bring you some bad news and you had some good news and you told her yeah. that you'd been saved and uh, she broke down crying. We didn't get the rest of the story there. What uh, oh, I got, I are broke you, up. did so, you break up then? No, no, I'm sorry. Probably the, the transmission uh, wasn't clear. So what happened was that she said to me, I want, she started to cry. We were confessing our sins to one another. When I shared my story about Jesus and how he saved me in prison, and I had asked, I told her, even if you leave me today, I didn't know she was going to leave me. I said, even if you leave me today, all I want you to know is Jesus as Lord and Savior. Right. That's what I told her. Yeah. And so she, she just started to cry. And so at that point, she said, I want Jesus. Uh, you know, I, I committed acts of sin as well. I committed adultery. And so we confess our sins to one another, like, like the book of James says. Right. And so God started to bring healing at that moment to our relationship. And, and we reconciled our indifferences. Mm -hmm. and, and we made amends and uh, forgave one another. And she accepted Christ right there at that visiting area. Mm -hmm. And you and your wife are still together to this We're day? We're still together. Yeah, still together. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We're still together, yes. That's we're Alexandra, the yes. one we've been talking to. Yes. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Alexandra is her name. We're still together. We love the Lord. We serve in the ministry together. Um, and, and we share our testimony. And uh, she's going to start writing uh, her, her side of the story, her testimony. And um, I just started a, a new book that I'm writing. It's about marriage. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is one of the questions I wanted to know if one day we can meet Alexandra. So, uh, Pastor, you, how many kids you had when you went to the prison? So I had three kids. I had two with my wife, Alexandra. Yeah. And then I was unfaithful to her during my, uh, I call it my BC years uh, before yeah. Christ. Yeah. When I was in the world and I had another child. Okay. Uh, so I had three children and, and they all loved the Lord. And uh, and Alexandra accepted it after she got saved. I mean, she found out prior to her giving her life to Christ. But uh, when I came out, we brought my younger daughter to live with us mm -hmm. uh, and because her mom wanted a, a better life for her, you know, mm -hmm. um, because she was still, you know, still in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, we we raised uh, my uh, my third child. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so. God yeah. work is always beautiful and powerful. Yeah. yeah. So you left the prison after many years of separation. The kids saw you a long time ago, your wife, and you come in the world. Um, the reason I want to ask this question is uh, because the people watching and there is the people who, go, who are still in that world when yeah. you were in prison. So Life is changed, the, the economical, you don't have a job, you out of the prison. And uh, can you tell us how God helped you that transition from prison to the world? So that's a very good question. <clears throat> you know, people come out of jail 
and the recidivism is high mm -hmm. uh, because they go back to the same behavior because they feel that they don't know how to do other things. Mm -hmm. And plus society puts this wall that, and with uh, stigma mm -hmm. and they mark them as, you know, convicts or uh, ex offenders and uh, unreliable. And so, you know, I, this is what I tell people. I say, look, you are a son and those that give their lives to Christ. You are a son of God. Mm -hmm. You are a daughter of God. And God wants everyone to come to Christ. He draws all people to himself through his spirit. And so when I came out, even though we struggled, I, I mean, I was hired by my attorneys. I had some skills there in paralegal work, but I left that. And I had other skills of, of business. And so I started that. But I had moments where I had nothing. Mm -hmm. I had moments of struggle. And I had moments that I didn't even have food to eat. I had an apartment with my kids and my wife, but we didn't even have food. And we would go to the local church to eat. So, but look what the Lord has done. I kept being persistent and saying, God has a plan for me. Like for everybody. God has a purpose and a plan. Mm -hmm. And it's not to harm us, but to give us hope in our future. And so I understood that, that even though I'm, I'm having challenges, even though I'm going through the fire, even though I'm being pruned, I'm being refined, uh, but I'm not going to give up. And people lose hope and they give up and they surrender to their, uh, to their depressions, to their uh, their demise, right? Uh, because of, they feel that there's nothing that they can get out of their, their 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 situation. But no, God can get you out of your situation. Jesus can bring restoration. So you have to have that kind of fortitude, that attitude. And I tell everybody, don't give up. Even if you're in your last hour, don't give up. Trust in the Lord. He is our Father. Mm -hmm. He is our Lord. He knows all things. And so that in that transition, I just kept on being persistent, trusting God, attending church, reading the scriptures, learning more about God, helping people, not thinking about self. And then God started to mold me and, and show me my purpose mm -hmm. and, and started to bless me in, in many different areas. And so that's why I say to, to those that are struggling with narcotics, those that are struggling with addictions, those that are struggling with all kinds of things, it, it's not... Don't give up. Seek for help. Let people come into your lives to help you, right? And be willing uh, to, to be helped, right? Because if you put resistance and say, no, 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 mm -hmm. what's going to happen is that at the end of, of your life, you know, you're going you're gonna to die. Right. And, right. and, and you, you know, you're going you're gonna to go to hell. Uh, you know, I mean, only God knows, but but the Bible, you know, clearly shows us that those that continue don't accept Christ and live a life of depravity and and all sorts of sin, obviously, is going to be death and separation from God, and that's a reality. And so, that's that's what I want to share with people that if, even if you're at your wit's end, God will step in and make your life great mm -hmm. and with purpose. Yeah, that's so. <laughs> I work in mental health and uh, addiction, depression, anxiety, drugs, alcohol, those kind of things is really, it's real in everywhere in the society. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, especially for young people who go in those roads just because they want to fit in. Is not because they want it, but they want to fit in. My friend is there. I want to be like my friend, things like that. And, the, yes. and that and, is our next generation. Yes, uh, you know, because they had lost their identity. That's right. And so they have subscribed to the ideologies of society, of the world, mm -hmm. with, with gender, sexuality, the culture of today. And but their true identity is found only in Christ. And that's where Christ shapes us. But when they subscribe to all the, uh, all the stuff that we see in our society, because they want to uh, put them in a mindset 
and in a place of total destruction. That's what the enemy wants to do. Mm -hmm. But Christ wants to give them life in that more abundantly. Look, I want to share a verse with you, please, uh, for, with your audience. Um, you know, it, it's a very familiar passage of scripture. And um, it's found in um, the book of Philippians. Okay. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Yes. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. Verse 7. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, this is where, and then it goes on, and, it, and it, it, it gives you the ingredients. You know, be pure of heart, good character. It gives you the subscription and how to live a godly life, how to live a fulfilled life. And this is where I tell people, you want to let go of drugs, you want to let go of addictions, you want to let go of depression, subscribe to this, the Holy Scripture, Philippians. The word of God will set will, will set the captives free mentally and spiritually. And, and that's what that's my my uh, advice uh, to them. Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So you're saying it's I, I know that. Sorry, I didn't mean it's to okay. interrupt you. I know that when we're driving a car, they say, look at where you want to go. Um, and that's uh, that's what I'm getting out of Philippians. So if 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 this is what you're after, you need to set your mind on these things. You need to set your sight on these yeah. things, and yes. you, where you're going to find that is in the Word. So if we if we set our minds on the Word and we're in it on a on a regular basis, and that it will transform who we are because that's yeah. where we're putting our concentration. Yes, sir, and it will show us our true identity. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Yeah, our true identity, mm -hmm. not the culture. And That's how right. the culture wants to shape us, mm -hmm. but how Jesus Christ wants to shape us. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah. the formula. And, yeah. And sometimes we need to be reminded that, you know, our identity is who we are in Christ. Um, exactly. The fact that we are children of God and that's who we are. We're not, we're not broken. We're not bruised. We're children yeah. of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. That is just a change of mindset. That's why the Bible says to guard your minds and heart mm -hmm. in Christ Jesus guard a guard is it's a protection mm -hmm. right uh from the elements of, of the outside coming in and so that's what christ does he he sets he says set your mind on the things above not the things below but things above are eternal and what jesus is saying here is that set your minds on the things above do not rely on the things that you see that are temporary and so we have to have a mindset like i am a spirit i have a flesh i have a, a body but the flesh makes war with the spirit right yeah because the flesh is is the king day by day but my spirit man is being renewed day by day mm -hmm. right and strengthened day by day and so my life is just a vapor is here today gone tomorrow but but it, it it's not relied on the flesh but it's relied on this holy spirit the spirit of god that dwells within me and that's eternal. And so that's the kind of mindset they have to change that. Like, I feel pain. I feel back pain. But you know what? That's a temporary state. I'm going to rely on the spiritual dimension right. to carry me through on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah. I... yeah. So, uh, Pastor, we are uh, children of God and uh, you are a pastor. You have a wisdom and experience in this area. And uh, like I said before, this problem leader are struggling. They don't, they, they, they don't know how to find the solution with the addiction in the society. Is there any word of wisdom you can tell a leader who built the system in jails, in, uh, in society? Yeah, I would say that uh, prison does not rehabilitate uh, okay. a person. Only Jesus can rehabilitate someone. Mm -hmm. 
Man. Now, this is what I tell people. And it's very simple. It's just uh, very simple. I tell people that are fight with addictions. I say, look at, it could be a cigarette or a, uh, a bottle of alcohol or uh, marijuana. And I, and I say, if you look at that, that substance, you're allowing you, not the substance. The substance doesn't have a brain that can't think on its own. The substance can't dictate to you uh, what to do, right? You have the power over all those things. You have the power over all those things. So don't allow the substance to dictate to you how to run your life. And what you're doing is you're allowing that substance to dictate who you are, who, who you are and, and, and who's you are, right? Right. Whom you are. And so that's what I tell people. I said, you letting this little, this in substance, this instrument destroy you right. when you have more power over it. Mm -hmm. It's simple as that. Simple as that. Well, I appreciate right? it. Yes. Oh, thank you. Do you have any yeah. other? Yeah, your story has been told with passion, joy, love, and forgiveness. I'm really yeah. moved. I, I hope really God use this uh, to, to transform people's heart out there. Can you talk a little about your book, the title? So we want to people to know about your book. Yes. Sure. So, so basically, um, the book, I, it took me about four and a half years to write the book. As I kept writing, um, I got picked up by an agent. And... Uh, then eventually got picked up by uh, the publisher, right? Which was um, Baker Publishing House, Bethany. It, it, it's a, a Baker Publishing Group, uh, Bethany House. And as I was writing, I was, my wife and I were thinking about names to name the book. And one of the names that we came up with was Shifting Shadows. We said, why Shifting Shadows? So James chapter one, verse James? 17. Uh, James. James. The book of James. Yeah. James chapter 1, verse seven, uh, chapter 1, verse 17 says, every good gift and, and every perfect, perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning now in another version i think i, I think it's the I, I have it here yeah it says shifting shadows that's right um, i'm reading from the king james version uh don't be deceived my my dear brethren. every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of heaven heavenly, heavenly light. light who does not change like shifting shadows yes so why shifting yeah right there that's good why shifting shadows because God does not shift. Right. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I was shifting in my life, moving from one side of, of my depravity and my world of darkness and shifting and shifting and shifting. And God was seeking after me, but I kept on shifting and shifting. He says, look, all perfect gift comes from above, from the from the fathers of heavenly lights. He says, I do not shift like shifting shadows. I'm here, be here for you. I love you. Come to the Father, right? I'll make you one with, with me. And so that's what God did, did, did for me. And so that's why I wanted to, to, to name it Shifting Shadows. And the subtitle, How a New York Drug Law Found Freedom in the Last Place He Expected, it was just, the uh, publishing house, they figured, hey, this would be a great subtitle. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would draw people to, to have interest in your story. And so that's how it came about. Yeah. yeah. Is it published yet? Oh, yeah. It, it, it was published in 2020 during the, uh, during the pandemic. Okay. Do you have the book yeah. in front of you? To show. Uh, yes. Yeah. Can you hold it up? Oh, there it is right there, of course. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, so of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so it's, it's a memoir and, uh, and it highlights uh, my story from my childhood all the way to what I'm doing now 
as a as a minister. Mm -hmm. How Actually, much is it? Yeah. Uh, you can well here in the United States you can pick it up in like Barnes and Noble for sixteen dollars, but in Amazon they have it obviously cheaper. Uh, it's an audio version as well. It's not. I, I wrote the book, but it's not the audio side of things. I didn't do it. It was they hired an actor uh, to do the audio re recordings, mm -hmm. uh, and it's also in Spanish. And Spanish is is uh, just in case you have any Spanish folks out there. Yes. Sombras cambiantes. Mm -hmm. Sombras cambiantes. And it's it's uh, the audio is in Spanish as well. Where did you live in the Dominican Republic? Uh, Bonao. Uh, it's uh, northwest. Uh, it's more like in the middle of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's in between uh, La Vega and uh, Villa Altagracia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is, uh, isn't that where it's all the palm oil and that comes from, that area? Uh, yeah, there's a place. Uh, it's called the Facon Bridge, Facon mm -hmm. Bridge rather. And they, they, uh, there's a lot of gold there. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh. Interesting. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. okay. Uh, uh, brother, there is one last question because I watched your uh, testimony before you talk about that. Um, for people who come out from prison, they, they still lose hope. They come in a society, they don't have a job, they don't have a hope, but they were in prison because of... Uh, addiction to drug and they go, want to go back there. They Now they're listening to your story. Can you tell them your story about uh, uh, that friend who didn't want to convert to- Ah, yes. Yeah. That's a good, uh, I mean, it's a sad story, but it's a good, um, it's poignant uh, what you're saying here because it has, uh, is detrimental what took place with this individual. So when I, came, I was released, I ran into a, a person that I was doing time with that I knew from the outside. He was uh, one of my muscle guys and uh, African-American uh, individual. And so in jail, when I got saved, I used to write to him and talk to him about Jesus. He says, yes, I want to turn my life around. I want to give my life to Christ. You're right. I've lived a, a, just a crazy lifestyle. And so I, I, was, I was released. And then eventually he was released uh, about a year uh, after... Uh, I was let I was let go, um, and then one day I ran into him in this place uh, in Corona Queens, and I said to him, "Hey, what's up? What what are you up to?" He goes, "No, no, I, I want to talk about you." He goes, "I've heard so much what God is doing in your life. You're you're ministering. You're doing these great things. You're helping the community. Man, I'm so proud of you." But I said, "I want to know about you. What what are you up to? You know, I heard you came out about a year ago." He said, "Yo, man, Christianity." You know, that's good for you. But for me, I want to go back to my hustle. And I was like, look, if you go back to the streets, there's only two things that's going to happen to you. You're going to get killed or you're going to go back to jail for life. And he says, well, I'll handle it. About a few months after that, my brother contacts me. He says, man, you don't know what just happened. Pick up the newspaper. So I came out of all the newspaper, uh, New York Daily News, New York Times. Uh, this individual, my friend, was coming out of a club. He was hanging out with uh, some rappers. There was some, you know, problems with these two rap groups. Uh, uh, it was a rival, and he was coming out of the the the, the club, and he got sh he went to take out his gun, my friend, and he got shot, and 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 he was killed. Oh. So I go around the schools and I show the letter that he sent me and his picture. It says, look. He wanted to give his life to Christ, but he did not. He decided to go back to the streets. And, and, and if your viewers want to look, look up the story, they can look up the story. It's called it's Rat Bash. Um, and I, I mean, I can share it with you. You can put in the link, but um, uh, it's a horrific uh, incident that happened. In Is Manhattan. this in your book, by the way? Uh, no, it's not in my book. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's Rap bash ends in slain. And it was a, a, a situation that was going on with, with uh, Ja Rule and uh, this other rapper called 50 Cent. And so my friend was coming out, he was hanging out with those rappers. He was coming out of the club and they shot him and they killed him. Wow. And so I said, look, he had the opportunity to surrender his life to Jesus, but he chose the streets and he was murdered. Mm -hmm. And so 
that that's the story that that you were referring to right uh one more thing i just want to mention pastor it's something that we see over and over again um and that we've really taken note in uh, in doing these testimonies is how god meets us where we're at and it's exactly. interesting to me that that day when you're when you went into that uh meeting in the prison and that and you were looking for peace and yes. i know you were a little distracted at that moment when when you were talking about that but it's really interesting to me how god met you with well, that yeah. peace mm -hmm. And uh, it's something that we see reoccurring and how God meets us where we're at. I, I've noticed that uh, each person is different. And you mentioned how God is the same, yet how he meets us on the, the you know, the plane. The personal level. level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's not really a question or anything. It just, it was just an observation. Yeah. Pastor, in your marriage and in your life, who is Jesus to you? Mm. Uh, and Jesus life. is my breath, the very breath that I breathe. He is my inspiration, my Lord. He lords over me. He is my father that I can go to. Uh, he is uh, the love of, of my life. Mm -hmm. uh beside my wife he comes first uh but he's everything to me mm -hmm. yes amazing yeah. and you have been in uh 50 country you said yes i've been uh, in africa i've been to chad benin uh um close to the congos uh morocco i've been to turkey and uh spain uh, through, uh romania uh, asia japan korea Singapore, Thailand, yeah, a lot of countries. Wow, amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, when you go there, they invite you or you just go preach? Uh, no, they invite me uh, and I've traveled with my uh, emeritus uh, pastor and now with my senior pastor at times. Okay. And then we do trainings and sometimes it's it's, it's uh, about my testimony or trainings. Yep. Okay, we keep in touch because we... We want to see how we can connect you with people here in Canada. Sure. I would love to come visit. Yes. yes. Amen. Yeah. Sure. Amen. Pastor, can I ask you to close us in prayer? Yes. Thank Amen. you. Father, we are so grateful and so thankful, God, for just this opportunity to be able to discuss your affairs, God, your kingdom. And we pray, God, for all the viewers that are watching, that are listening. We pray, God, that you would reach their hearts, oh God and that you would transform.